Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are excited to have you with us today. If you are sitting closest to the center aisle, please make sure to sign the fellowship pad and pass it to the people sitting next to you. If you're a guest or visitor, leave some contact information so that we might be in touch. Uh, this morning, Pastor Lagutin is not with us today. Uh, he is at Fountain of Life Lutheran Church in Kernersville, uh, where this morning he is uh, baptizing Denise Johnson's newest grandbaby. Uh, so he will be uh, with them for worship this morning. Today we have Pastor Paul Nielsen with us. Uh, we're delighted to have him sharing with us God's word. Our adult Sunday school uh, class has moved to the chapel. If you have not had an opportunity to join since it has uh, made the move from the sanctuary over there, just so you are aware, uh, it is now meeting in the chapel between services. Uh, next Sunday will be the last Sunday for the uh, love offering that is towards the missions uh, in honor of Pastor Johnson's birthday. There's more details about that in the bulletin. Also, at the end of this month, on Saturday, April 27th, is going to be our mission team golf tournament. Uh, there's more details about that in the bulletin as well, if you would be interested in, in being a part of that. And finally, if you ordered an Easter flower and haven't ha uh, picked it up yet, please pick it up in the parish hall today. With those few announcements, let us go ahead and begin uh, by singing our opening hymn, 465, Now All the Vault of Heaven Resounds.
make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in word and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may be your grace con- may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God through the same Jesus Christ your son who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever. You may be seated. Our first reading from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 
and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of God. Our second reading from 1 John, the first chapter, as well as the second. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This, too, is the word of God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus oh, I apologize. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
You may be seated as we'd like to invite the children to come forward for a special children's message. And then after that, we will continue with our sermon hymn, 735, Have No Fear, Little Flock. your sister? You did? Okay. Well, I think we got a couple more coming still. Don't worry, guys. We'll wait for you. (laughs) Safe. You okay? (laughs) All right. Just about everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How many of you have ever had a nickname? Anybody have a nickname? Does anybody want to share what nicknames they've had? Maybe just share one that you've had in the past. What's your nickname been? All right. Nat. Nat, okay. What's your nickname? What was it? What was it? Clolo. Clolo? Okay. How about you? Um, Lonnie Bear. Lonnie Bear. Okay. How about you, Jackson? JJ. JJ? Okay. So, so a lot of us has, have had nicknames in the past, right? I've had nicknames since when I was real little, even younger than Sadie here, right? My first nickname I remember having was Scooter, and it was because instead, instead of crawling, I scooted across the ground. But my most recent nickname is one that has stuck with me for about five years. Some of you have maybe have heard my high school kids call me this, Grandma. Now, I will explain this nickname because I have always had adults asking me this as well. The nickname comes from about five years ago. We were at a youth trip at a hotel in Charlotte, and we were teaching a dance to the song to this other group, and I hurt my ankle. And I hurt it really bad to the point where I couldn't even walk on it. So the hotel had to bring us a wheelchair. And the high school and middle school kids got to push me around in the wheelchair all weekend. And they started calling me Grandma Matt. And then it just dropped down to being called Grandma. And that's a nickname that has stuck for five years now. I can't get rid of it. They always call me Grandma. In fact, I will be at Walmart and I will hear somebody say grandma, and I'll turn and look, and it's just some kid talking to their grandma. I have a complex about that nickname. That nickname has stuck with me, even though I didn't want it to, right? Now, uh, in our gospel reading that we heard a couple minutes ago, one of Jesus' disciples gets a nickname from this account that has stuck with him for almost 2,000 years now, that I'm sure he probably didn't want that nickname to stick with him, right? The disciple's name was Thomas. Does anybody know what nickname he got? They started, they started referring to him. Do you, do you know it? Tom. Not Tom. That'd be a good one. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. They started referring to him, and we even talked about him as Doubting Thomas. You see... One day, Jesus' disciples were all gathered together, except Thomas wasn't with them, and Jesus appeared. All the other disciples got to see Jesus alive, and they were excited about it. So after Jesus leaves and Thomas returns, they tell him. And do you think Thomas believed them? No, that's, that's where he get the, got this nickname, Doubting Thomas, that he said, unless I, I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger in those marks, and unless I put my hand in his side where the spear went, he said, unless I do all that, I will not believe. Now, eight days later, it tells us they're all together and Thomas is with them and Jesus appears again and he says, Thomas, put your hands in, my, in the the holes in my hand, he says, put your hand in my side. Stop 
doubting and believe, or stop disbelieving and believe. Yeah. Did it say that the door was locked? Yeah, the door was locked. Jesus just appeared, right? Now, Thomas didn't have to put his hand in Jesus' hands or his side. It just tells us that Thomas declared, my Lord and my God, that he believed from seeing Jesus there. But Jesus had some special words after that. He said, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who's Jesus talking about there? Those who have not seen and yet believe. Everybody, right? All of us, right? Those that we hear God's word, we haven't seen Jesus ourselves, but we hear his word and we believe, right? Jesus saying, blessed are we because, not because we have seen, but because we believe that we have faith, right? That faith that he has given to us through the gift of his Holy Spirit. So why don't we thank him for that faith this morning that we may believe that he is the Son of God, right? So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll thank him for that. Will you guys pray with me? Let's fold our hands. I'll say a line, and you can repeat it back after me. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the faith that we have so that we might believe in you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for coming up. You can head back to your seats. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. Seems like a while ago, but it was only last week that we celebrated, and the celebration continues throughout this entire 50-day season of Lent, during which each of the six Sundays that we worship during Lent has this uh, historic old Latin name attached to it, each one different. These are names like Misericordias Domini, and Jubilate, and Cantate, and Rogate, and Exaude. These words just sort of roll off the tongue. Today's name for this day in the season of Easter is personally my favorite. It is Quasimodo Geniti Sunday. Quasimodo. Kind of makes you think of the hunchback of Notre Dame, huh? Quasi means like, modo, the mode is in the mode like, and geniti has to do with generation or birth. This is like, like newborn babies Sunday. Quasimodo Genity, like newborn babies, 
Sunday. The theme for that verse, that name, is taken from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, where Peter writes, Like newborn infants, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up to your salvation. The historical background here is uh, it's rich and it's precious. In the early church, the catechumens, those who were preparing for baptism, were baptized on Easter evening. The newly baptized were given white robes to wear that symbolized the righteousness of Christ that they had just been baptized into, and they were to wear those robes at all times for eight days after their baptism. On the eighth day, they would come back, they would change back into their street clothes, and as they changed back into their street clothes, the bishop would recite to them 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up to your salvation. So there's a very real sense here in which the follower of Jesus never grows up, never fully grows up. He's always weaning. He's always nursing on the pure spiritual milk of the gospel. And so whenever the church is gathered together for worship, just like we are right here, right now, it's kind of like, if you can picture this in your mind's eye, it's kind of like a nest full of baby birds with their heads cocked up and their mouths open and they're screaming for that pure spiritual milk to be dropped into their mouths so that they too may be satisfied in their hungry hearts. So there's a myth that's been going around for quite some time now and the myth says that if you're really a real Christian, Well, then you're supposed to eventually grow up. Stand on your own two feet. Quit acting like babies. Eventually, you ought to get past all this baby business of confessing your sins over and over again, asking for forgiveness, craving those words of absolution. You got to grow up. You got to start acting like adults make some progress, learn to take care of yourself for crying out loud, stop acting like babies. And the truth, actually, is just the opposite, isn't it? We're never, ever so grown up in our faith, so mature in our faith, than when we are like newborn infants, little babies, who are dependent, totally dependent upon Jesus. In fact, the more you grow up in your faith, the more you crave that pure spiritual milk that only he feeds us through his words and his sacraments. So if you want a good picture of a church that fits this description a church that looks the way a church is supposed to look, it's the one in our gospel text that we just heard for today. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. They had seen their Lord arrested, beaten, crucified, laid in a tomb, Now they wonder, who is going to feed them? Who is going to protect them from their adversaries? Who is going to take care of them? How will they survive without him? So there's the conference that takes place every once in a while, and it's called the Courageous Churches Conference. This is not a picture of those who have just returned from that conference at all. They had been so bold and courageous before. Thomas, of all people, Thomas had said, let us go with him that we may die with him. 
But as soon as the men with swords and spears showed up, they all ran away. And who knows, Thomas might have been in the lead. And now he's risen from the dead. And he's told the women that he wants to see them, which sounds, doesn't it, like thrilling news? Unless you're the one who's abandoned him. Unless you're the one who's betrayed him. Unless you're the one who's run away like a coward. Like newborn babies, they're afraid for their life. What if he really is alive? What if he really does find us? And then, and then, Jesus walks right into their trembling and their fear. He comes right through the locked doors. He doesn't bother to knock. He doesn't wait for us to invite him to come into our hearts. No, he just walks through the door. He just comes to his infants as a hen to, comes to her chicks, as a good shepherd comes to his lost and trembling sheep, and immediately he begins to drop his food into their open mouths and feed their hungry hearts with his peace be with you. To be sure, this is no skim milk, not 2%. This is whole milk, the cream still on it. Pure, spiritual milk. No additives. No laws or rules or necessary contributions or dues that's mixed in that you've got to pay before you can get it. No, this is pure gospel peace be with you. His words give just what they say. Just what they promised to give all along. My peace I leave with you My peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you do I give. Peace be with you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. As if to say, open wide, my little babies. Drink deeply, my little children. For I have drank the cup that you are afraid of drinking down to its dregs all for you. And now I give you in return nothing but pure spiritual milk, forgiveness and life and salvation, that your hearts, your empty hearts, your trembling hearts might be filled, that you might have peace. Which is not to say, and so don't go jumping to conclusions that are wrong, which is not to say that there is no punishment for our sins. There's punishment, all right. Don't ever think that your sins go unpunished just because he forgives you them so freely. It's just that, as the prophet has said, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him And by his wounds, we've been healed. And so when your heart condemns you, when your heart screams at you, when your heart tells you that even God couldn't forgive you for this, you recall those wounds, the blood that flowed from them, and you let those wounds preach to you, saying, God is greater than your heart. After this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad. And he does the same thing still. He comes to you, his little babies, and he announces his peace to you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And he puts his wounded body right into your hands, And he pours out his precious blood right into your mouth. And like newborn babies, you taste the goodness of the Lord. And we have peace, a peace which this world cannot give. A second time, Jesus speaks his word of peace. Peace be with you. With his first word of peace, he sets them free from all of their fears. And he fills their hearts with 
joy, peace. Now with his second word of peace. Peace be with you, he says again. But with this one, he sends them to feed others with his forgiveness and his love. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is, for one of a word, this is Jesus, little Pentecost. He breathes his Holy Spirit upon those gathered in this room behind these locked doors. His big day of Pentecost is going to come 50 days later when multitudes are gathered together. But here he breathes on those whom he has raised up to be his apostles. Kind of reminds us about the beginning, doesn't it? In the beginning, he had breathed into the lifeless man that he had fashioned out of the dust of the ground, and the man, by the breath of God, became a living being. Now, he breathes on these lifeless apostles of his, and he fills them with his new life, just like he had breathed on those dry bones in the desert. And they came to life a vast army, Now he breathes on these dry-boned disciples and they become the one holy Christian and apostolic church. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. It's important for us to see what he's doing here. He is binding his word to their mouths. If they remain silent, so will his word and his little babies will worry themselves to death. Rather, he puts his word of forgiveness on their lips and they're to speak it because it is only in speaking it that they receive it. There to speak his love and forgiveness and his peace to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness of which there is no other kind of satisfaction. And all who will hear this apostolic word of forgiveness as from the Lord himself receive it and are satisfied. Which brings us to Thomas. He wasn't there when Jesus came into the room. When Jesus fed his newborn infants. When Jesus showed them his wounds. And when Jesus breathed on them. Friends, this is what you miss when you miss church on Sunday. But the disciples do just what Jesus had told them to do. They breathed out the breath that he had breathed into them. So the other disciples told him, they spoke, we have seen the Lord. So that's the first recorded sermon that the disciples preach after their commission from Jesus. It's short and it's really sweet. After the big Pentecost Sermons will get much longer, even longer than this one you're sitting through now. But here, it's simply a matter of one eyewitness saying what their eye has witnessed. We have seen the Lord. It is an incredible sermon. But Thomas, you see, Thomas, he doesn't believe it. He can't believe it. Thomas has a problem with believing the word that comes from the apostles. In the Nicene, we say that we believe in the one holy Christian and 
apostolic church, which means that we believe the word of the apostles. But the New Testament really is. The apostles received the word from the word made flesh, and then they handed it down to us through the New Testament, the written word. It is the apostolic word that brings us the testimony of what they saw with their eyes. Thomas, however, is not ready yet to confess the Nicene Creed. He could say, he would say, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, who suffered and was buried. But what he couldn't bring himself to say, at least not yet, was, and on the third day he rose again. Because he didn't believe the apostolic word. You see, Thomas is no baby. He's a grown-up. In fact, Thomas is a charismatic. He has to have more than just the word. The word's not enough for him. He's got to feel it. He's got to touch it. He's got to see it for himself. He wants a word directly from Jesus, not from his apostles. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not Believe it. And so one week later, we come to the second Sunday of Easter. That's today on the church's calendar. Once again, the disciples are in the room. Doors are locked once again. They're still afraid. They're still unsure. They're still like newborn babies. They don't learn things the first time. It takes a lot of repetition over and over again. It takes probably being here every Sunday, folks. Eventually, eventually, they'd leave the doors open. Their faith will mature. And when they leave the door open, Caiaphas and his thugs will come through that door and do to them just what they had done to Jesus. But by then, their faith will have matured. And in fact, they will become so mature in their faith that they will consider death for the sake of Jesus Christ the highest honor that could ever be bestowed on them. They will leave this world with a confession of faith on their lips and a song in their heart proclaiming that word of forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ that they are just begging to speak and declare. But on this night, on this night, Thomas was with them. And Jesus once again entered the room right through the locked doors once again, and he feeds his little babies once again the same pure spiritual milk. Peace be with you. You just can't get enough of it, can you? So please notice this. You got to notice this. There is... There is no scolding or reprimanding of Thomas. No lecture from Jesus. And what a disappointment Thomas is. You don't even get a, where were you last Sunday during church? Once again, he shows everyone in the room his wounds. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. This is just the way it is with Jesus. He doesn't leave Thomas to drown in his doubts or perish in his unbelief. No, he comes to him. And he offers his side to, G- to Thomas's hand and he speaks his forgiving words into Thomas's ears just as he does for you. And by the power of that word that creates faith in the heart where it was once filled with nothing but fear, 
Thomas responds, my Lord and my God. There's a lot more than than meets the eye right here, and you dare not miss it. What Thomas sees with his eyes and touches with his hands is the humanity of Jesus Christ. That is, he sees and he touches a human being with flesh and bones and blood. But what Thomas confesses with his lips is my Lord and my God. He sees true man. He confesses true God. In other words, Jesus gives Thomas exactly what Thomas had demanded from him and so much more. Historians record that after the big Pentecost, 50 days later, Thomas went to India, where he preached the good news about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and he died a martyr's death. The Christian church in India, which is bigger than you would imagine, you'd be surprised. The Christian church in India to this day holds Thomas to be their patron saint. Today, the same crucified and risen Jesus Christ who came to Thomas comes to us, his newborn infants huddled together here in this room. By his words and by his wounds, by his breath, by his spirit, he feeds us with the pure spiritual milk of his forgiveness and his life and his peace. In all our disbelief and in all of our doubts, he invites us to reach out our hands and to take his body and to open our mouths and to drink his blood, saying, do not be disbelieving, but believe. Happy Quasimodo Genity to you all. Amen. We stand to confess the Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all this Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We respond to the grace of God with our gifts and our offerings.
We continue with the response hymn 763, When Peace Like a River. stand for prayer. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. 
We especially pray by name for Nancy Hildebrand, who fell on Friday, broke her hip, and had surgery Friday afternoon. We pray for healing. Heavenly Father, your Son is the firstborn from the dead. In him, we have been reborn into a new and living hope. We pray that you would nurture us with the pure spiritual milk of your word so that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. As your people, O Lord, who are united in the common life and love of your resurrection from the dead, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that you would build up the households of your people, that your holy children, begotten in holy baptism, may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have instituted authorities to carry out your justice among us. Bless all who make, administer, and judge the laws of our land. Give them wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to your good will. Lord, in your mercy. As your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, give your presence and your comfort to the troubled in our midst, especially Nancy. Comfort her with the assurance of your care, and according to your good will, grant her healing. Comfort those who weep and who mourn with the blessed joy of the resurrection from the dead that you have established, Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, You have given us the Holy Gospel and instituted the Blessed Sacraments, that through them we may have comfort and peace and your forgiveness for all of our sin. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily believe your word and through the Holy Sacraments establish our faith day by day until at last we obtain eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord, as Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.